All right, so let's dive into the heart triad. So we've been covering the heart, head, and gut triads. That's right. Um, the Enneagram has nine personality types, as we all know, and they're divided into these three categories of the centers of intelligence. And the centers of intelligence is really um, where, like when we are in a situation, how do we take in that information? Do we take it in through our head, our heart, and our gut? And where do we react from? And so in this episode, we're gonna focus on the heart triad, which are types twos, threes, and fours. Now, for these three types, they have an imbalance in their feelings. But again, they are going to... It's so funny whenever you say they have an imbalance in their feelings, that sounds like a diagnosis. Yeah. But we're not talking about that. This we'll, is... we'll, we'll dive into more what it means. That's right. Yes. Um, because the gut center has an imbalance in their gut reactions yep. and the head center has an imbalance I in I have their an imbalance thinking. in my head, <laughs> if I'm We honest. know, we know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, but this group, the twos, threes, and fours have similar assets and liabilities in this think or the, in this feeling center. Um, and so, the, like I said, they're gonna engage in life with their feelings. Now this looks very different for each of the three types. Um, the type twos are the ones that they feel other people's feelings. They will walk into a room and they have this antenna and they just naturally um, can understand and consume what other people are feeling. Now the type threes, what's interesting is they actually don't use their feelings very much because they believe that it's going to hinder what they want to accomplish, their goals and tasks. So they push their feelings to the side so that it can stay on task. Now the type fours, on the other hand, they have all of their emotions and they feel them with great depth and intensity. Now again, the heart triad, we want to realize that they also share um, an emotional reaction to these areas which they struggle with shame. Okay, now we all struggle with shame and they don't have just the corner on on shame, we all do, but this is the one that really pops up the most for the um, heart triad. So they focus primarily on their identity and significance. And when they are feeling shame, they're really trying to obtain the identity or the significance that they feel they must have. So the twos, they wanna be seen as the most supportive, caring, nurturing, and selfless person. The type threes want to be seen as the most successful, admirable, and accomplished person. And the type fours want to be seen as the most special, different, and most authentic and unique person. Okay, so with that, let's introduce our guests who are a type two, a three, and a four. And we're going to be able to ask them questions about what it's like to be in the yep. heart triad. So uh, just explaining the heart triad, how did that land on you all? It feels very accurate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Completely well, accurate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great. Well, Megan, you're our guest, our type two guest. Uh, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Hello, everyone. My name is Megan Jackson, and I live in New York City. I moved here to pursue acting, and a couple of years ago came along um, the, Enneag uh, the YEC or the BEC becoming an Enneagram coach program and um, feel like it's kind of like God's been leading me to this kind of thing as a coach for 10 years because I do just love people. I love their stories. That's right. Like kind of what actors do is they get into the minds and hearts and souls yeah. of the character. Yeah, right. And I feel like that's what an Enneagram coach does as well. And so, yeah, I'm coaching one-on-one -on -one here in the city and I'm excited to, to continue to grow and learn and excited to be that's here. That's awesome, Megan. Yeah. Do you find yourself with looking at scripts or watching other performances, thinking through type, the lens of uh, different types? A hundred percent. I feel like I watch TV now. I'm like, oh, an unhealthy three there or like, <laughs> right. you know, like I'm, I would call it out and it's fun. And also like knowing when, like my roommate, knowing when to be like, maybe she doesn't want to know that that, you know, like, oh, there's a five, you know. So yeah, I do it all the time. <laughs> Maybe she doesn't want to know that. That's funny. <laughs> like, oh, she's like, say, oh. Where it becomes a problematic experience in doing that is when they've written a character mm -hmm. that may be inconsistent with the Enneagram. Right. 
Yeah. So the trajectory, the, the character story may be, so like Nate on Ted Lasso is yeah. a debate in the family. Yeah. Um, oh, because he seems to take a big but, departure. Well, in the in the departure. second season, at the end, he, I believe, departed from his type drastically in a way that's not typical, the type that I think he is. And mm -hmm. then this season, he's starting to come back to the type that he presented. And but I still kind of disagree with with how they presented that type. Um, OK, mm -hmm. so I'll just say I think he's a type nine. And mm -hmm. typically, the type nine is not going to move to the unhealthy parts of type three around everyone else to the degree that I felt like he was at the end of season two. Um, it was mm -hmm. it just felt like a huge break in character and it didn't. Um, seem consistent with at least how I've experienced the Enneagram. But now in this season, I can you can see the type nine coming out again, the the um, not feeling assured of himself and does anyone mm -hmm. care and trying to be seen, especially by, and we won't give everything away, but by the girl in the restaurant, mm -hmm. the um, hostess, like he's wanting her to notice him, you know, mm -hmm. um, and that he has importance. So I'm thankful that they're getting back to what I think is his, uh, type, but I will say it was really hard as an Enneagram coach to break character or the consistently the consistent with the way that the Enneagram shows yes. up. Anyway, no show should ever be on. That's TV. just a side note. We're getting well, into we're getting in. We sh this should be like a whole podcast. It's a whole another podcast. Um, Writing, so, acting. So, Mike, mm -hmm. tell us a little about yourself. You are amazing. I put these uh, labels on everybody, by the way. <laughs> so, so, go on YouTube. He did not write amazing type three. I wrote that. <laughs> so, I want to give him the out. Yeah. So, if you go on YouTube, uh, you can see their names and the titles that Jeff gave them. <laughs> so, Mike, you're the awesome type three. So, yeah. Wanna, thanks. Uh, so my name is Mike Parrott. I'm on Southwood Campus Outreach here in St. Louis. Um, I'm married to a type six, and I have two boys, Thomas and Dawson, who are eight and six. And so our life is full of accomplishing a lot of things right now and trying. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but we're also you know, in seminary as well. Yes, I'm. I'm in seminary, and so. Yeah, I've been in full-time ministry uh, since I've graduated college in 2009. And so, you know, when it, the Enneagram has been so helpful for me, especially over the last years as we've just dove into a little bit more, because I think it's helped make sense of parts of me that uh, just I felt, felt clouded for so long or like ways of operating in the world that I just, mm -hmm. I didn't know why I was doing these things or why I felt these things. Mm -hmm. But then also... It makes sense of why I really love parts of my job. Like I love coaching people and helping right. them become the best versions of themselves. And I love kind of getting it, my hands dirty with them and helping like set a vision and accomplishing a task with them and realizing that's, that's a good part of me that, well, that God's made. And I will say, so Mike was our son's boss when our son worked for CO in St. Louis for a year. Um, and I think what I was most thankful for was I feel how much you have grown even in years past as a three, because the things that I heard and saw represented in you was ex experiencing life to the degree that a three can in an authentic and genuine place. And because mm -hmm. what I could, I could tell was that your heart was able to grasp the grace of Christ so much that you knew that being authentic and real only revealed his glory in and through you. And that just spilled out into, you know, our son's life and the ways that you nurtured and cared for him. And so anyway, I just want to say, you know, just thank you for doing the hard work because that's not easy. And we'll get into a little bit of that for the type threes where emotions and authenticity is scary, but, um, that's why I'm really glad that you're here because I think you'll be an excellent representation of the spectrum of struggling with these things, but also how God has enabled you to go to the healthier places in lots of seasons of life. So anyway, it's good to have you here. Thank you. Thanks for saying that. Yeah, it's Nate. We have a Nate was helpful, but I, why has he's been so helpful? My, my team, we use it consistently with each other and mm -hmm. it's just fostered, I think, a healthy, um, really healthy dynamic amongst us. And so. Yeah, it's been fun. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And then Leah. Welcome, Hi. Leah. 
Glad you're here representing the Type 4s, which is, I, I guess that's kind of a hard place to be as a 4, because you can you have one 4 represent all 4s, or are all 4s <laughs> <Okay. fours> unique? <laughs> right. And it's, it's almost like a, a hurtful comment to say, how could I ever represent 4s, because we're all different. But she is the most captivating mm. type four, according of to your title. Th that's right. That's that's how she rolled. <laughs> Which is like the perfect compliment for me mm. right now. <laughs> just, I was like, oh, he understands me already. Uh -oh. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. So you. tell us about you. Okay, I'm I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, my name's Leah Everson, and I'm married to my husband Tim. He's a type nine, and we have two boys. Uh, my background is in pastoral ministry. I have my MDiv from Denver Seminary, and we were out there for 10 years when I was working in the church, and then we moved back and sort of had a crisis of purpose, like existential mm. crisis. Floors don't mm. experience those. Right. Uh, but, <laughs> and that was like when I- Is that when on I, your schedule I, every year to, to oh, have- Oh, a, a weekly. Yeah. But no, <laughs> well, um, so- I actually dove into the Enneagram when I was really not sure what I was doing next um, yeah. in my mid thirties and uh, discovered I was a four. I had been mistyped as a two or a three before. Yeah. So um, that was really helpful because it helped mm. me realize that a lot of my thoughts and feelings weren't necessarily true. Um, and then That's became really a tough. coach in, in 2020 um, with the pandemic. I was, working in an office job and I hated it and my kids came home and it kind of pushed me to move forward with coaching. So I've been doing that ever since. Awesome. Um, so it's been really good. Well, that's great. Well, yeah. So I'm excited to dive into the heart triad and help people to understand really what that even means for you guys. Cause each of you guys are so different in this triad. So we're going to take a look at type twos first, and we'll talk with Megan about that. And then we'll move on to Mike with the type threes. And then Leah will talk more about the type fours after that. So again, the, the twos in the feeling triad, they are the most giving and selfless types on the Enneagram. Um, they serve others really all the time. They're constantly thinking of others. What's really remarkable about the twos is, like I said earlier, they can walk into a room and they have these feeling antennas that really understand the needs um, and feelings of others that are around. It's funny you say that because we just had a conversation with our daughter this last weekend mm -hmm. that when we were creating YEC, it was a very difficult time. Yeah, stressful. Uh, mm -hmm. And I hadn't secured another job yet. And so there was a lot of financial pressure. And so Beth and I would get spun out, Be or Libby would come home and just and feel, feel it. it like she knew just walking in the door mom and dad have been fighting in this yeah. house <laughs> or or they're having a day or whatever they're... yeah <laughs> and and they those emotions of others come and land on the two and really kind of envelop them um and it can be very weighty uh for the type two uh one other example and i'd love to hear megan when we get uh to bringing you know your insights in if you've had experiences like this, well, we were at, I think it was in Philadelphia and we were walking down right. town with uh -huh. Libby and this person was running up the hill in this kind of like cocktail sequence dress, but with like a heavy coat on I was oblivious. and sneakers. I did not know that. I barely remember walking past that person. Right. And whereas I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm feeling this like. As a nine, I'm like gathering like intel as well. Nines and twos do this. But mine is more just gathering like the energy. Is something okay? Is something off? Whereas once she passed us, Libby's like, she's not okay. Something's wrong. And I and you could just tell Libby's countenance dropped. You know, like she literally felt whatever that person was feeling. And I just was so intrigued with that. As a parent, it was really helpful just to go, wow. Like that is a gift and a burden, you know, for her to bear. Mm -hmm. And uh, how can we as parents uh, lift the burden, but also encourage the gift that it has? Now, part of that gift is, again, feeling all of these feelings and they want to serve and help others. And the reason is that one of their greatest fears is being rejected. 
So what twos often do is they'll negate themselves and what they need because they fear that others are going to notice that they're focusing on themselves. Like even if it's in the healthiest way, they're still thinking, oh wait, but others are gonna think I'm being selfish and unkind um, and therefore they're going to reject me. So the twos will repress their feelings and focus on the feelings and the needs of others and then come through for them. So in hopes that other people will see them as the most selfless, kind, giving, nurturing per person and therefore not reject them. Um, and so Megan, that just kind of paints, you know, a, a broader picture. Oh, and the other thing is, is shame. So they feel great shame in the, the thought that they might be selfish. And so again, they're going to repress those needs and their own emotions and just take on the emotions and needs of others. So hopefully they won't feel the shame um, that they could be selfish. So Megan, I'd just love to hear just an overview of like, how does that land on you and what rings true? Um, yeah, that the shame is very, like when I went through BEC, when you, the, the, the idea of being in the feeling triad and dealing with shame, like Beth said, like every human deals with shame. But when I realized like the two, threes and fours, our core struggle is shame. So we feel it weightier. So it's like, yeah, I have all the feelings all the time. And yeah, when shame like comes in, it like feels very heavy. It feels, it manifests in my body and it, it mm -hmm. feels like I can, like it's all I'll ever feel. It kind of becomes very all consuming and very visceral. And so, yeah. So when I feel like I can't support or be there for someone in the way I feel like I should, which I think for two is being very careful of the sheds, like, you should have done that. You should have done this. You shouldn't have, right? Like, especially <laughs> with that one, three, the three's like, you should, you got to get it done. The three wings like, let's, let's go. And the one's like, oh, did we do that right? Did we say that uh -huh. right? And so if I feel like I haven't said or done whatever it is, then it just like, and it ha I mean, right, it happens every day. So even on Saturday, I was feeling a shame spiral because I wasn't getting the kind of result or outcome I thought. And I was like, it's because you didn't do this. You didn't. And I just, and so I have to, being careful I think with shame, how, how I talk to myself and also mm. being able now with awareness, now that I know shame is a huge struggle of being able to call it what it is of like, okay, this isn't going to last. Like we're okay. Um, but yeah, it feels like it feels very much, very, very weighty for sure. Yeah, can, <clears throat> hearing you describe that. So there's a great book by Chip Dodd called The Voice of the Heart, and he talks about healthy shame and toxic shame. Mm -hmm. But it, as I hear you speak, one of the things that really laid heavy on my heart is that you are you also have the two wings of the type one and the type three, mm -hmm. uh, both very performance, right, wrong, driven. So uh, when you're starting to experience the shame, how does the one wing show up for you whenever you're going in the shame spiral? And then I'll ask the same question about the three, mm -hmm. but then the opposite is that what you just said, that those part of you actually help you to get out of the shame. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so how does well, the one and three show up in shame? Can I just, because I, I, to I totally want her to go into that, but what I want the um, listeners to know is that this concept uh, comes from our book, More Than Your Number, where we use what's called Enneagram Internal Profile or EIP, that we have, we're more than just our main type, that we have connecting uh, parts of us, connecting types that influence us greatly, whether in healthy or unhealthy ways, depending on where our current heart condition is. And so for you, Megan, uh, two of these parts are the wings, which is your one and your three that you're you know speaking of. And I think that's a great, because what's interesting is as she was talking, I was like, yeah, as a nine, I have the wing of a one and I know how she shows up and I have, I'm a, I have a connecting line to three and I know how she shows up and it's, it sounds very similar. And so this is going to be, to me, a really intriguing conversation in how those two parts show up and then how does it also maybe similar for, for me and how they show up. So Megan, again, how does the type one show up uniquely for you and then the three in a different way? Yeah, so I would say more predominantly two wing one, which is the servant. So this desire to like having this strong internal moral compass, like wanting to do what's right 
for mm-hmm. other people and with other people. And so, but the one wing, right? Like I, the one having the inner critic. And so I think that's where the one is like, oh, you shouldn't have done that. You should have responded to that earlier. And so, and that's what the what the three and the one, two being like that self-condemnation. So that was huge for me too, as a two. We don't really need anyone to condemn us because by George, we're going to do it on ourselves. <laughs> and I think that's what shame does. Of like you, um, oh. so the one, the one definitely, I think, is like, hey, you didn't do that right. You know, we might get in trouble. And like, mm. right too is I remember listening to Annie F. Down's podcast. She was interviewing a male and female of each type. And the mm-hmm. two said, nothing makes me feel worse than when I feel like I've disappointed someone. Yes. And that, mm. it, right? Because two is being so relational. Like, it is just crushing. And even when, you, like, we want to resolve the issue, even though it can be really hard. But then even after it, maybe resolve like well I will carry it and that's what shame does it's like it, it allows me to carry it we want to wallow in it we want to hide we want to run and so um it can be a little uh, confusing uh, because for the two as you mentioned like you don't have to really criticize the two because they've probably they're already have these parts of them that are criticizing and coaching them along on how to help and serve other people mm-hmm. Uh, but oftentimes twos don't present, a, and this is the messy part of the Enneagram, is that it, it, it explains our glory and our depravity. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah. but for twos, oftentimes they present more confident mm-hmm. when they are the most scared. Yeah. And so a, to yeah. mention it, like, how does that show up for you where, okay, you've got your one showing up in your head that you should have done better, someone's disappointed in you. But there's a three part of you that still wants the image of being the servant. How mm-hmm. does all of that show up in your relationships? Yeah, that's good, Jeff. You said we we come across confident even when we're afraid. Is that what yes. you said? Right. Yeah, that's that's huge because I feel like even I gave my testimony at church, got baptized last Sunday, and I remember saying oh, like, "That's awesome." It was great. It was beautiful, oh. but it was very vulnerable. And so the idea yeah. of like, I, I remember saying like, "I don't ever feel ready for anything," but mm-hmm. yet the three and the three wing is like, "Come on, we can do this. You got mm-hmm. this." Like the cheerleader comes out and is like, "So like, I can." And then I think that's where the desire to help others and serve. So when I am in a healthy place, is like because I'm so familiar with shame, I can also see it really well in others. And I'm like, hey, mm. like, you know, Brene Brown, who um, she said, like, we often talk to ourselves in ways we would never talk to other people. Right. And so I think in my like growth um, as a person and in the Enneagram, it's the idea of like, you know, being aware of like, how am I talking to myself in a way that I would never in my supportive nurturer to when talk to other people and so i think there's how do i help myself do that but then also how do i help others to be aware mm-hmm. of like hey this is how you're talking to yourself and how can we well, be yeah, kinder but, uh, one other feature i wanted to talk about with this triad for twos is that reading the and feeling the room mm-hmm. um there's a oh man in x-men there's a character who has to wear gloves i can't remember her name but if she oh. wear if she Anyone? wears Rogue, I think. Is it rogue? I, I mean, for a two, like you're, you can't turn that off. Mm-mm. And so, but what you have to somehow maintain bound emotional boundaries mm-hmm. with a person that you may or may not even have a relationship with. It's just, it's right there. Tell us about your experience of reading the room and feeling uh, the kind of energy from other people. And along with that, I would love to hear, because what I've heard from twos is when they go in and they read the room, they're not just really going to go help every single person. They're Mm -hmm. usually drawn. And I would love to hear who are you most drawn to and why? Oh, um, I think I'm drawn to the, um, the person who I sense there's like this sadness about Right, Mm -hmm. because I can read the room. I can feel the energy, whether it's anger, frustration, sadness. But I think someone that, um, and they don't have to necessarily visibly be crying, but like, ooh, there's something wrong. And even from Mm -hmm. a young age, I remember like noticing people at the lunch table in the cafeteria sitting by themselves. So anyone that Mm -hmm. I feel 
is alone or sad. And just um, because I can sense that even more than they can sometimes, it's like I, in my two-ness, I'm not afraid to step into that where other people are like, oh, feeling so, oh, why are you crying? Like where yes. I'm like, I'm like, hey, what's going on? And, you know, usually people is will it, open up. Is it connected with the one of the biggest fears of a two of you being rejected and maybe thinking that that person is either feeling rejected or is being rejected? I don't know that it's that I, I feel like, oh, I don't, I don't want to re be rejected, but there is this, this innate deep sense of empathy of like, I can't imagine what that's like. And so it's mm -hmm. this ability to really like put myself in their shoes. I mean, I can't mm -hmm. fully do that, but I think, right. We talk about like, Eights offer their will, fives offer their mind, and twos offer their heart. And so I think in those moments when I do connect with someone, I'm just, I am like, it's just like my heart, it's like my heart, I can't help it. It's just like my heart is mm -hmm. going. Um, mm -hmm. And Beth, when you were sharing Libby's story, that has been a journey of me living in the city, right? Because mm -hmm. there's homelessness right. in, you know, any big city, but I think post pandemic, it's up more. And so, um, and you're walking right by it. There's an outreach program here in the city called Don't Walk By. And it's the idea of like, let's not walk by our homeless friends, right? But like, if I were to not walk by any, I'd be doing that all the time. And so it is like also being in tune to the spirit, which of uh, like, and I, ha I have lots of different stories of what that's looked like, you know, a woman like wailing in the rain and I stopped to talk to her. And then took her to McDonald's and we had a meal. And so like, that's what twos can offer is like this presence of allowing people to be felt and seen and understood. Um, wow. Now, Megan, did your family, how did they relate to that gift of feeling other people? Did they affirm that gift? Were they frustrated by that gift? I would definitely say they noticed it. Like, cause I was always like a yeah. really sensitive child. And like, I often joke, like if anyone's had a conversation with me for five minutes, you've probably seen me cry, um, whether it's for others or happy things, sad things. And so I would mm -hmm. say like, yeah, I, I think they noticed it and I think um, found it like endearing and um, oh, like, great. oh, I love, I love your soul and your kindness mm -hmm. and um yeah, I, and I think that's what's beautiful about the Enneagram, kind of like Mike was saying earlier, is, and Brene, Brene Brown's work also helped me with that because she's a shame researcher. So I was like, when she talks about vulnerability and the power of vulnerability, I was like, oh, it just affirmed things I always knew and mm. felt. But also we assume, which is what's beautiful about the Enneagram, that everyone thinks, feels, and does things the way we do. And we just don't like not everyone's going to feel comfortable walking up to someone who's sad and hurting. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't mean we don't like, you know, look to try and do those things. Right. Like, especially as believers loving others well, but it's also like, oh, that's an innate gift in me. And so how do we nurture that? And then how can we encourage others? And um, yeah. Well, in wrapping up just the twos, I'd love to see also using the Enneagram from a gospel centered perspective and what that's meant for you in being in the feeling triad. So the fear of not belonging, being rejected, um, not being wanted and loved. And yet Christ has stepped in and completely shown all of us. But, you know, we're talking to you specifically how he has pursued you. He wants you. He loves you unconditionally. Yeah. How has that impacted your heart and and just how you then move through life yeah so i think beth you talk about how like each type right we're all made in the image of god and so each type that's the beauty reflects the image of god in many ways but i think there's also really specific ways that each type does kind of uniquely and so i think something that the twos do is really just offering like the compassion and mercy of Christ of like yeah. that being f fully present with people like he Christ knew when to lean in and who to help and then he also took time to withdraw and so like he didn't help all people at all times and so just like really leaning into the compassion of Christ mm -hmm. and then also it's freed me a bit knowing like 
it is my nature to be like, yes, let me help. How can I support and encourage? And so like when you have passages that are like serve and do nothing out of selfish ambition and I'm like, oh, twos, you know, and so it allowed me to like allow some like grace of like, don't hear that as like, we got to go serve. We got to serve yes. now. It's like, yeah. okay, you know, and something that I remember my pastor said in a sermon like about three years ago in the midst of the pandemic of like, Jesus is the hero. Mm -hmm. Megan is not. And so um, when I'm, yeah, when I'm feeling the weight of others and the burden of like, I can come alongside, but like Jesus also has to carry and has carried yes. the burden of our fears, insecurities, sin. And um, a hard word like that is so freeing. Yeah. <laughs> You're not mm -hmm. the hero, Megan. Ugh. Well, that, and that, <laughs> that he is a perfect representation of both helping others and taking care of himself. So being right. fully human and fully God, he had to sleep. He had to nurture himself with food. He mm -hmm. took time alone, um, you know, being away from people. I mean, he could have. Uh, healed people and served people and nurtured people 24-7, 365. But he chose to be in a human body that needed certain nurture and care, and he mm -hmm. represented that. And so I think, you know, that is such a um, a great thing for twos to keep in mind is like, so how did Christ take care of himself, you know? And mm -hmm. how can we represent that part of him as well as the part that nurtures and cares and supports um, them? Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you're enjoying this content and you want to take your Enneagram journey to the next level, well, consider working with a personalized Enneagram coach. At myenneagramcoach.com, we offer one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions that are tailored to your unique needs and goals. Our coaching services can help you to gain a deeper understanding of your Enneagram type, overcome challenges that are holding you back, and develop a personalized plan for growth while transforming. Now, whether you're struggling with self-condemnation, fear, and shame, or simply you want to unlock your full potential, we're here to help you. If you're ready to take the first step towards transforming your life with a personalized Enneagram coach, then head over to myenneagramcoach.com right now. Thanks again for tuning in, and we look forward to helping you in your Enneagram journey. Well, thank well. you. Yeah, thank yeah, you, Megan. Thank you, Megan. Let's move into uh, the type threes. Now, type threes, again, you guys are in the heart center and you're probably thinking, really? <laughs> because, and it's not because. <laughs> it's so funny. Threes don't have a heart, though. Yeah. Well, <laughs> they do oh. have a heart, but they do. They do. <laughs> what's so fascinating about the threes is their ability through kind of ways of survival when they were younger is they felt that they had to be the most admired, successful, accomplished uh, person, whether in their family, their school, their sports, their you know musical instruments, whatever they were doing, they really felt this need to appear successful and then be admired and, and told how great they were doing because that's how they would feel loved. But the problem is that shifts with every group you're with, right? So your family is going to think this is amazing, but then maybe your coach over here thinks something different is amazing, your youth group and so on and so forth. So the threes are constantly assessing situations of what does this group, person, um, environment think is the most uh, awesome, uh, uh, the most admired, high status, great image for that particular situation. And then they learn to shape shift or um, become more like that in order to gain the affirmation. So in order to do that though, they are, they've taught themselves um, to naturally put their feelings um, aside and their, their authentic identity to become whatever it would be to be admired in that group setting. And that it just naturally happens. But that's hard because then they have a harder time than bringing up and accessing what are their true feelings? What are their true emotions? What's their um, true identity, their authentic self? Um, and so that's a hard process. And what I've heard from threes is when they do try to go there, it feels so a lot of people are like, oh, they're just, you know, surface level people um, because they're just shape shifting a lot and they're not being authentic. They're not being honest. Um, 
But what we want to understand about a three is to get to those authentic emotions and their authentic um, identity from a genuine place, it feels, and if you're watching this on YouTube, you can kind of see my hands, it feels like they're coming from where they're at and they're having to free fall as if like they're falling into a well and they have no idea where that well will end. And they're just free falling into this blackness. And it is very scary because they don't know what this is going to mean for them. They don't know where they're going. What do other people think? This has been their whole world. And they would rather not have that experience. And so they typically move back up to the surface of where they can shape shift and just put on an image because they know it works. They know they're going to get kind of like, quote unquote, a hit of mm. love through achieving Um versus taking the time to allow themselves to rest in the the gospel, rest in the love and the admiration that God has for them because of how he created them and what he has done through them, which is that free fall. And then they land into the knowing, the full knowing of, oh my gosh, I am loved for simply being me. I don't have to do all this stuff. Like he sees me fully and accepts me like, and that fall is so hard for them because it's just too scary. But when they get there, that genuine self emerges. So Mike, does this sound remotely true for you? And if so, what, what comes <laughs> to mind? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I can think of so many times where it's so funny the way even you describe the struggles of a three, but also part of me actually really enjoys the thought of achieving even as you're right. talking um which is i mean i think it's so it's a both right like it right there, it's two sides of one coin like we want you guys to achieve you guys are so phenomenal at motivating achieving mm -hmm. encouraging um making things better like we want that and at the same time it can also be a detriment to you just like we were talking with megan with taking on people's feelings um so sorry go ahead no, you're right. And even as we were, uh, as Megan was talking about shame, I was just thinking about even my own, you know, story and thinking about the wounded child and just kind of my, uh, why I'm so, or at least as I've been walking through life, the proclivities I have towards why I value certain things. So for example, you know, I was an athlete, but it was never enough for me just to be a good athlete. I always was comparing, am I the best athlete? Mm -hmm. And if I wasn't, then I had to double down and work super hard mm -hmm. at, and that was my gauge. Because of what? Like, why? yeah. So, what was like maybe um, as a kid, what was your thought? Like, well, if I'm not the best and I have to work harder because. Yeah. So, some of that is my own growing up. So, I was born with a cleft lip and palate. And just, you know, the, you can imagine for a three as a young kid, all the mm -hmm. kids kind of pointing out, uh, uh, birth defect that you have it just reinforced that i'm not accepted i'm not mm. loved but i was a good athlete i could mm. i was more usually more athletic faster taller stronger than most kids and so that was my end yeah. is to at whether recess whether it was with sports teams i'm gonna be the best <clears throat> and i just can't be good because to get in that circle to be accepted to be approved by other people mm -hmm. i have to accomplish and kind of do different things and, you know, that uh, played its way through through a host of different things as I was growing up. But even as I became a Christian, you know, my freshman year of college, then I found myself, you know, in taking a Christian form of different things. Mm -hmm. You know, even though I knew I was accepted to Christ, I learned very quickly coming into a certain Christian group. OK, here are the practices I need to do. Here's here's how good I need to perform. Mm -hmm. And then I'll get affirmed by these people I value in the Christian community too. And Mike, I, I don't think I've ever shared this with you, but uh, so I had been loosely tied to a church growing up. They would invite me to VBS and youth camps and, and I'd usually make a profession of faith and want to turn my life around uh, at each of them. <laughs> but uh, it, it wasn't until my, I don't remember that was a junior or sophomore year, probably sophomore year. No, it's probably junior year. Yeah. Um, but I, I just, I, I was trying to go get a date with a girl who went to that church. And, um, so I went to church that Sunday and my parents were like, I, I'm going to land the plane. It relates to three, but, um, I'm not trying to tell my high school dating, uh, <laughs> history, but it didn't work out. And, but I sat there in the church service and 
uh, Jesus showed up and like the scales fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth and followed thee. Right. Um, I mean, I just quoted that. Like, I know. That was That's one of my good. favorite songs. <laughs> that is awesome. Can it be? Here. Oh. There you go. Um, so I go out to my car. I take out my Metallica Master of Puppets cassette tape. Um, and this is my your, sinner's your prayer. Your three part came out shining. <laughs> this is my sinner's prayer. God, I'm going to be the best you've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. But, but I mean, I totally took, I mean, you know, there's all kinds of meaning that go into that. Like I really wanted this, this is my new self now. Yeah. But it, it was taking this performance mentality into Christianity now that absolutely it, where even our faith can actually be a symptom of our performance heart. Performance and with that, heart. what I'd love to hear in kind of relation to the heart triad with that is my Tell us what it's like when you see those aha moments of, oh, I'm going to get praise or accolades or um, be admired if I take on this image. What is it like when you have that aha moment and you then your inner world goes, oh, well, then I need to move that other image to the side or my authentic self to the side or my emotions are going to get in the way. So I can get to that place. What it, what does that feel like internally to shut off emotions and your identity? Yeah, I uh, it's <clears throat> so when I'm struggling, it's funny because I I want to I feel like I've been seeing it in two ways. And one way I actually wanted to ask you about, but the first way um, I've, I've seen it is I literally just inwardly think, okay, let's shut this down and then just go accomplish this or do this. Like mm-hmm. you can do this, of course you're going to do this. Like this and. <laughs> You know, it's going to feel it's really that good. It's strong of a pivot. It's like, okay, done. This is what's yeah. going on. Yeah, there have just been times where I felt, yeah. you know, uh, whether it's I'm going to be exposed or whether, you know, um, these people are going to say this about me or whatever. I can just inwardly like, okay, it's time to take that box, close it, set it on the shelf. And, you know, you just got to get to work and go mm-hmm. do this thing. And... um and you know, in those times, I think I feel I feel inwardly clouded a lot. Is hmm. the way I describe it is that my thoughts are I feel a sense of hurry. So if, you know, I was tell yeah. Tracy, um, and even my staff team, if I feel like I'm talking faster or if I feel like I'm in a hurry, it's because inwardly I'm feeling a, like something's happening where I'm feeling shamed or I'm going to be exposed, and so I'm just trying to accomplish something to like suppress mm-hmm. those feelings <laughs> so mm-hmm. like the box is like popping open that i've tried to set aside um but mm-hmm. that's usually what's happening for me is that i feel super clouded um just even in my thinking and um speaking but the other way i've seen it uh re- more recently pop up is um i've been accessing that almost like when i need to for motivation so mm-hmm. i set it aside and i'm like okay well, they're going to say this about me, but I don't know if it's like the athlete in me where it's mm-hmm. like, they're going to say this about me. So let's get that. And I'm going to go prove them wrong. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like I'm yeah. going to go like, so it's a motivator. It's a, it's a motivator. Yeah. And then I'm mm-hmm. going to rub it in their face and they're going to say this <laughs> and this about me. <laughs> and so, <I> <laughs> it's so funny as you guys are talking because um, it'll be interesting with, with Leah because I don't have as much like because we use all nine types. I don't have as much four, but obviously mm-hmm. when um, Megan was talking about the one and the three, those are connected to me. And Mike, as you're talking, I'm like, oh, my gosh, like the I was just thinking when you were like, I'm in a hurry when we're at the airport. Oh, man, <laughs> she is like zippy. Like, I, I don't like, even know why you're like, you're I almost even, running. I'm like, I don't even know. I'm like, <laughs> we have just, we have got to go. And, and like, I'm a nice, I'm kind of a slow, like, you know, meandering kind of person usually. But when I'm in the airport, it is like, I leave my family behind. It's like, we are going. She will sprint to the gate. And then we get there and it's like, well, what, so what were time. you in a hurry yeah. for? And then we have like an hour and a half, you know, it's <laughs> but hurry up to wait. But when you're. When you're talking about that, Mike, I'm like, I totally know what you're talking about. Now, that's not who I am all the time, you know, because three is not, you know, my primary type. But when you were saying, I was like, yes, I know that part. Like, mm. it, it it comes up. And sometimes I don't even know 
what it's afraid of. What is it running towards and why is it running away from something? Usually mm -hmm. it's like, well, I don't want to miss the plane, you know. Of course, then my six is probably showing up going, well, here's all the things that could go wrong. And the three's like, well, I got gotcha. you. Let's go, you know. Yep. Um, but just as you're talking, I'm like, yes, I know what that part is. I can I can feel it. So I'm hoping that the the listeners can realize that though we're talking to a two, three, and four, how do these parts, if they show up very much, how do they show up in your life? So I just kind of want to highlight that real quick. Well, and it, just to speak to the gift of the three to be able to pivot. Yes, it's and, amazing. I mean, I don't. I mean, compartmentalize has negative connotations to it. But I'm assuming, Megan, like whenever you're going down a shame spiral and you've got to kind of get yourself together to re-engage, that three part of you learning how to overcome the tsunami of emotions and just move forward actually is a gift. And Leah, I'm assuming for you that people associated you with the three from what you said earlier, that mm -hmm. it's a strong part of you that helps you to get organized despite what you may be feeling to be able to move forward in your calling. Yeah, would, absolutely. Would either Megan or Leah, would you get, like to comment on that? Yeah, definitely. So that example I gave of Saturday, there was like, I was going on the shame, I shouldn't have, should have. And it was actually, I didn't think about it in this way, but I think it was the three wing. I realized I had to make a decision, but I was like, oh, I don't know, because I don't know what they think, because we twos care a lot. I mm -hmm. think a lot of the feeling tribe cares a lot about what people think. And so I finally, I like made a time because I was about to be in analysis paralysis and I had to be like, Megan, what would you do if you weren't afraid? And yeah. so I think that in a, some way was maybe the three being like, hey, it's okay. Like, you know, mm -hmm. you can do it. We got we to gotta keep moving forward. So that, yeah, yes. that's I think an example of how the three was like, hey, we're going to do it and we're going to do it afraid. It's probably okay. Mm. Yeah, I yeah. love that. And Leah, what about you? Yeah, absolutely. I was actually just thinking um, when I first learned the Enneagram, it was at um, the church where I was on staff. We went through the Enneagram and I was misdiagnosed, disdiagnosed when we say mistyped as a that's three. That's awesome. Yeah, that's a Freudian slip, let's be honest. Mistyped. You've always known there was a problem. <laughs> I love that. Oh, man. Anyway, why? pastor our senior pastor said that's why i hired her she's gonna get this job done and i was starting a study center with another staff member and so like my ability to get things done my ability to accomplish things it's like up on my strengths finder um and so um that's really strong i mean but i do the yeah. the most the shift emotionally um it's been interesting and i'll go into that um has i've actually think i showed up as a self press for for a mm. long time mm. um and that has kind of shifted so i think i really did know how to show up and um and do what needed to be done especially if somebody gives me a goal i can meet that goal like i i know what i need to do and i can i can get there if i have to establish the goal myself it's a little bit more tricky yeah yeah hey mike um and as it relates to emotions so we developing emotional intelligence, learning how to name uh, and address what we're feeling. Uh, everybody has it, but for a three, does it? Do you ever sort of misapply emotional intelligence where it becomes much more like you're accomplished in your ability to name your emotions? Like, man, I yeah. am the best at emotional intelligence. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But I mean, it's funny, even the thought of healing, I thought about this a little bit, that I think of healing as a path like this. It's just, mm -hmm. it's, well, that's what it means to heal, is you've well, learned. Is that, I mean, that's pretty much just, your, oh. everything in life, right? It has to, right. and, oh. and for those who are listening, he is showing a upward trajectory, like on a graph, you know, yeah. like we are that moving awesome. towards 100% right up. <laughs> success. Um, I was actually talking to the pastor of our our care um here and he was just talking about you know walking through challenges with people and you know, particularly in our family as as we walk through ministry struggles and he said mike you want to run but are you willing to just walk with your mm -hmm. family uh she needs to walk and i thought mm -hmm. uh, i don't know <laughs> so well i mean that's like um, yeah well, like, well, like well, me hey, in the airport you know running's good for your body so maybe you should all be running <laughs> but <laughs> but it's kind of like either like 
like Mike and I in the airport where it was like taking off, leaving right. our family behind and not realizing it, but also thinking there's a good reason for it. Like, well, we don't want to be right. miss the plane or we don't want to miss the goal or the image or whatever it is. Um, and so what was that? What was that like to reflect on that question? Like what came up for you? I think it was a sense of um, vulnerability. I probably is the best word of like, I think I'm running because it just to, to be, to walk or to wait or to feel any of these emotions feels vulnerable to me. Mm -hmm. And like you're saying, like, I just want to shut that off and perform because that's yeah. <clears throat> how ultimately I think I'm going to be accepted. But it's, but it's interesting because, you know, if we think about even, the gospel and what Christ has done and how it's worked in my own life is that like, just to face it, like, you know, Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn. Like, I think mm -hmm. just like the reality of facing, you know, my failures, but not only that, just facing the shame and guilt and realizing that I have the resources of the gospel and that I'm united to Christ. Like that, that's who I am. Mm -hmm. And I think even as a leader and follower of Jesus, that mm -hmm. what I've, and this has probably been one of the biggest points of growth over the next last few years for me is that not running from that, but sitting in that and realizing, okay, like, but I'm still loved and accepted in Christ. And then that actually propels me outward instead of then I'm propelled through the strength of Christ rather than my own strength. So then I don't over function as a leader and I'm much more secure. I feel like <clears throat> that would probably be the biggest word that I think my family and those on my staff team would say is that, you know, as I've walked through some of these things, if I'm just a more secure leader, I'm not mm. like it's operating out of all that. We talked about this with Megan earlier that when she's feeling the most insecure, sometimes it comes across as more confidence. And for threes, I think everybody just assumes like they're confident, they're secure in who they are, and mm. they can run. When in reality, uh, and I think you know my good friend Travis in St. Louis, but mm -hmm. we saw a guy running. Uh, on the highway next to the seminary. Oh, that's right. Or, he wasn't on the highway. He was on a service road. And and then, like, just a second later, a cop car drives by uh, with its lights on. And Travis says, you know what? We admire those who are running, but we never ask, what are they running from? Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. it, it, when hearing you say, like, you know, at times it, it feels like, yeah, I'll, I'll portray confidence, but inwardly I'm actually very afraid. And and just one last thing, and we'll go to type four. You know, Mike, your your willingness to engage in your heart mm -hmm. has been a gift to our son. Yeah. As you shepherded him from experiencing spiritual harm and still having a desire to serve Christ within ministry and then mentoring him for a year. Like I I you know, as a father, I want to be all things for my kids, and the and and I never can be, but the Lord has put men like yourself in Nate's life that have had significant um, uh, blessings in his life for healing, yeah. and so I, I'm just grateful for the work that you've done. It, it has mattered. So if if you need another trophy, yeah. the McCord family is a trophy on your shelf. Mm. about doing the work and blessing our children and helping them mm. uh, along the way in their own stories. And I so. think that's what's yeah, so awesome about when we, because the Enneagram often, when we start learning it or reading it, and when we're not in a good place in our heart, we just see everything that's negative about ourselves and highlight, right? And, and it's just like blaring at us. And then we get into those shame cycles or criticism cycles. Um but a lot of times we miss the beautiful side of our type. And I remember when we were first learning about the Enneagram, I would, there was one book that talked about all the different nine levels of health. And I looked at the, the healthiest levels and I'm like, that's not even close to where I'm at. And, but I was like, wait a second, but that's still who God created me to be and how to reflect him. So I'm just going to take the time to pray these things over myself and knowing that God will work those in me in his due time. It was very interesting. Beth would walk through the house. Uh, people listen to my voice. <laughs> I, did I matter to people. <laughs> I did like, well, sure, Beth. Uh, like, she didn't do that. Like, I'm embarrassed just you even say that. I'm like, I would never do such a thing. Uh, <laughs> my voice matters. <laughs> Um, but in all seriousness, I think 
it's important that we all recognize when God has worked in and through us that it is not about ourselves pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps and fixing ourselves. It's about us surrendering, depending on him and the work Christ has done in and through us um, now and moving forward. And uh, Mike, that's truly what, because I know we could sit here and we could say, kudos, Mike, good job, you know. Um, But ultimately, I think what we're saying is we've seen you as a three humble yourself, recognizing your need for the cross and your need to be authentic and real, that you're safe in that, which gives you this, the gives other people security and safety in you. And so anyway, I just hope that other threes will, will hear that as well. Ready to, for type four? Ready for type four. All I right. mean, is Leah ready for type four? I don't four? know. I'm ready. <laughs> it's getting pretty personal here, Beth. This is a... Yeah, it's a good one. It's a good one. Well, yeah, so fours, you know, being in the heart triad, um, they have no feelings. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's the complete opposite. Fours <laughs> feel all of their feelings and then some, um, the highs and the lows and everything in between. Um, and they're constantly searching for depth, intensity, beauty, um, whatever's authentic and real. Um, is really where they want to go. Now, for them, they struggle with the feeling of shame, and this is where they feel that others aren't able to see who their most authentic self is, that they have a special quality about them and that they are misunderstood. And being misunderstood is really hard on them because it feels like they don't belong, um, that they are somehow an outsider. And they And in order to get others to see the significance of what they offer the world and in something creative, unique, and it's not creative, like we're not talking about like always being an artist and a painter. It's unique in whatever uh, field or passion you have. um, Well, our lead pastor in Illinois, Mm -hmm. his was sermons. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. it was his, the pastoral counseling that he offered people was Was his biggest expression. of Who he was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. His unique value, his creative um, ability to see people in a, in a different way. So for the fours, again, they have all of these emotions. And, um, and you know, I always talk, talk about how fours, it's like, you know, the, the lottery machine with all the ping pong balls in it. Mm-hmm. Well, they have all of these emotions inside. And they're very aware of what these emotions are. And if you would love to know those emotions, like, hey, what are you feeling right now? Um, they're kind of wondering, do you really want to know, like, are you going to take the time to really listen and understand me? Or are you just, is this just kind of platitudes? Because for the four, they can see all of these ping pong balls in there that have emotions and they can take one at a time and nuance it and talk about it and share with it. But they want to know that you're going to receive it, that, that they have a place that they can belong and be cherished and they're, um, that they can captivate the audience with beautiful be- beauty and depth. Um, but the emotion of shame can well up because they feel as if they're defective and flawed, that there's something wrong, that others can't understand them. And that really sets them on a trajectory of going more inward into their emotions and into these kind of fantasy worlds or emotions that aren't actually happening. And they think that that's reality. Um, versus being able to sit with what actually is happening. And so they may then project those fantasy emotions onto other people thinking that that is what they feel, which then can heap more shame and more withdrawal. Um, So, Leo, how does this land on you? That's a lot. I mean, I just having you explain it, it's like the weight of all of that. I feel it on my chest right now. Like, Mm -hmm. um if I were to try to like describe that on a regular basis to how things are going, like um, Mm -hmm. it just feels very heavy. Um, It's not always very heavy, but um, there are times where that shame spiral um, becomes the only thing that I can see. And that's when it's really scary. Um, Mm -hmm. And so my thoughts, um, I, I think depth is a word I've used and overused. I actually was writing a book and someone reviewed the manuscript and they're like, you can't use the word deeply anymore <laughs> or, deep, <laughs> or deep. Like she <laughs> seems to cut that out. And I was like, I didn't even realize I was doing that. Right. Um, mm-hmm. Well, because, and that's what's interesting real quick is that each uh-huh. type has its own lexicon, their the own words they use a lot. So fours use 
depth and beauty and authenticity and uniqueness. Yeah. And what, what I say about that, and I would, sorry, I cut you off, but yeah, so sorry. the fours will say they're intellectual. The fives would say that they um, are intelligent and the sixes would say they're smart. And mm -hmm. they all kind of mean the same thing, but each of those words has a more specific meaning that feels true for how they view the world. And so depth and beauty and longing really captures a lot of the four. Is that true? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Longing is a word that um, I resonate with constantly. Like I'm always thinking there's something missing um, or like things are not quite the way I want it to be or that it should be. So I'm looking for um, like it's it's good for pulling out like the redemptive qualities and things or mm -hmm. like we're going to we're going to move forward from where we are. But if I can't find that, then I start to believe that nothing is going well or can go well. And mm -hmm. um, and most often that is, has to do with myself and like who I am and seeing that something's missing in me. Um, I really re related to Brene Brown's um, description or definition of shame as being there's something wrong with me mm -hmm. uh, because that that's what resonates. That's exactly yeah. how um that's how I felt for a very long time and I can go there pretty quickly if I'm struggling and then do you find yourself moving out in the world when that happens or m retreating inward and what what's the typical pattern I definitely withdraw um I will stop trying to put myself forward um if I'm struggling and if that shame is is there so um it's a growth step for me to move forward, to put myself out in the world. And really, I've learned that like my body, I need to engage my gut. I need to engage my body physically in order to move emotionally forward. So yeah. whether that's exercise or I learned from KJ Ramsey, um, tapping or, you know, some sort of something that gets me out of my head and out of my heart so that I can process it at a, d at a different level. Mm -hmm. Um because otherwise I will just sit, sit in my head with the same thoughts going on and on over and over again, if I'm struggling. Yeah. It's funny you say that, Leah, I was watching a TV series yesterday and this guy was in a mirror. He was upset because he had failed or have been betrayed. And he was contemptuous for himself for allowing the betrayal to happen. Mm -hmm. But he started slapping himself in the face and I thought, you know, there's another way to engage in your body. Like that, <laughs> you can gently tap on your forehead. You could go on a walk. I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But there, there is walk. something mm -hmm. physiological that can, that needs to happen in mm -hmm. order to help us kind of get out of these patterns mm -hmm. of thinking and feeling. Yeah. I'm oh. so grateful that God has given us these bodies to be able to move forward. In that way even yeah. if it's just cold water or something stepping outside changing the environment like these things can shift me emotionally yeah, we saw well. a tiktok beth sent it to me because i think she assumes that i'm always anxious it's an assumption mm -hmm. though um that's supposed to be a joke uh because i typically <laughs> am. i don't even know what i'm anxious about yet but i'm sure i am you, well, or you're anxious that you're not anxious yes oh no that'll there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh but it was like this guy was saying like, hey, if you're ever overwhelmed with anxiety, put your face in a bowl of ice water and it, it'll just knock you out of it. I, no, yeah. it is ice water. So why not? Well, but, but it also what it does like physiologically. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. It, it kind of and it's, it's, I think that's what people when they talk about grounding or, mm -hmm. you know, like even meditating, like whether it's on scripture or prayer or, you know, lots of different things that it, it takes you out of that spiral, that um, shame cycle, or uh, what is it, analysis paralysis or rudimentary, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and it gets you out of that, and you can then kind of choose a different path of, of going. Right. Now, Leah, well, how did your family relate to your emotions? Growing up? Yeah. Uh, I would say they didn't always understand. Um, I don't necessarily know that they knew what to do with my tears. Um, so I learned to take them into private um and so oftentimes especially my teenage years so maybe i shouldn't say the whole time but like as a teenager i would take that into my bedroom and alone um quite mm -hmm. a lot 
And um, so they didn't actually even really know, because I really ended up dealing with depression and they didn't know how, how hard I was experiencing it at that time. What types were your parents? Type one and type five. Oh, yeah. So my mom's a one and my dad's a five. <laughs> Both yeah. very logical they types. May not very have logical. Had the yeah. To... yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and so um yeah, it's just like not the world they live in. Um, right. What would have been and, helpful to hear from them? I think it would have been really helpful to know that even if I'm having feelings like I belong and mm. um it's okay mm -hmm. to cry. Um mm -hmm. because I didn't quite receive that. Um Actually, I did well, not. So just it. having <laughs> emotions nice. felt like it excluded <laughs> yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. I just, it, they didn't know what to do with it. I'm the oldest of five girls mm. as well. So I saw their overwhelm, I think, with that and their parents were sick. And um, mm. and so I I kind of removed myself eventually too. Just kind of was like, all right, so right. This, isn't, this isn't helpful and I don't want to add something else to their so I moved to the like the two in stress and mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. definitely just pulled myself away. So too, even so. for yourself, though, you had messages you were believing about that my emotions are not helpful to the right. family. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. 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 And I really well, resonate with I am too much, not enough. Like that flux mm -hmm. is um, that that statement, Beth, that you give is really helpful and just helping me even identify what am I experiencing right now that's difficult? Like, am I feeling like I'm being too much or, or do I feel like I'm not enough? Like be, that helps ground me as well. To yeah. now, to Leah, do you read people and around that idea that, oh, they just gave me that this look, so they must think I'm too much or they yeah. just gave me this look. And even before the situation even happens. Yeah, I will anticipate things going wrong um, or, you know, people not accepting me. Um, but then also in the moment, it's, I take it very personally, a look or something, if I'm really struggling. Um, I work to, to not do that, yeah, but right. that can be an, an issue. So uh, as we kind of wrap this up, you know, we mm -hmm. kind of talked about <clears throat> different ways that the gospel has really helped us to get out of these states and how we were created to reflect Christ. And so the great thing about fours is you guys are the bodybuilders of emotions, meaning you you can handle a, a wide range of emotions. You're not afraid of it. Um, you move towards it. You know, so when people are struggling and sorrow and grief or even have highs, like you're able to engage in that. You're not afraid to go there, um, which is really beautiful. And at the same time, what we've noticed is those highs and lows, like you were just talking about, can be too much. Because um, a lot of times when fours are feeling they don't belong or they're flawed, they will try to project a unique image that hopefully others will then be like, oh my gosh, that's you know beautiful. And like the word here, captivating. And then mm -hmm. they're like, oh, you get me. Um, but I would love to focus in on with the with emotions and how amazingly God has equipped you to be in emotions, what it also looked like for Christ to be in emotions. So for mm -hmm. fours, because we're humans and mm -hmm. you know, we're on this side of heaven, those emotions again can be either genuine and true and helpful to others, or they can be self-focused and temperamental and overwhelming. Whereas Christ is our great representative of what it's like to deal with emotions. And I think the Garden of Gethsemane is such a great place to see how emotions are wonderful. They're beautiful. They like he had so many emotions and so much stress that he was sweating blood. And so yeah. he didn't shy away from it. He entered it fully. He could have been like, I'm out. <laughs> like I don't want to do this. Mm -hmm. But he not only did he enter the emotions, but he exhibited the highest quality of four, which is equanimity. So we're not saying Jesus mm -hmm. is a four, but he just he showed emotional balance. So that what that means is we're not getting rid of emotions. Right. We're embracing the emotions, but we're not allowing it to control us. Mm -hmm. And that is what how Christ represented emotions so well. Can you tell us like what it's been like to move into that healthier place mm -hmm. to still feel emotions, but it not um, take hold of you. Yeah, I spent a long time feeling like my emotions were controlling me. And when I learned the concept of equanimity, it felt very freeing. Like, 
I can actually experience the end of the emotion. So rather than like, I'm learning to, to experience my emotion and learn from it and go, what is it trying to tell me here? What am I, what's the message I'm hearing? Really taking through aware. Like I learned a different process before learning aware with you. Mm -hmm. Um, But really taking. It's pretty awesome. So I don't know if you like. It's very helpful. I use it. Yeah. (laughs) But just this, what am I feeling? What am I thinking? What's the story I'm telling myself? And listening to my emotion, because that will tell me what's going on rather than believing that what my emotion is telling me is the truth about my situation. So the emotion, if I'm feeling like everything's going wrong and um, I'm believing people don't love me, well, maybe I'm stressed about something that happened specifically. Mm-hmm. Maybe I can explore that a little bit with some curiosity and and see if it's actually true. And usually I can find some sort of pattern that mm. um, that I've, I've known over time that, oh, that's what's happening. I was triggered because I felt like... Um, I felt like I really screwed something up with work or um, my husband looked at me and probably didn't see me the way I wanted him to. And so now I think he doesn't love me. Well, really, he does. So Mm -hmm. like just letting just letting myself um, process it and and get to the end of it and um, not being afraid of it has been, I think, a gift in my relationships and just being able to be there with other people. I, I say being able to sit with people. And their hard emotions is like a superpower for me because yeah. I'm, I really am not. I would prefer to spend some more time in your harder emotions than to hear how everything's going really well in your life. Yeah. And um, that that is a better experience for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I just think, you know, just thank you so much, guys, for just being here, showing up, um, being like real with your struggles, but also where God shines, you know, brightly through you and how it blesses others. Um, And I hope that, you know, our listeners have been able to really gain a better understanding of the heart triad and how you guys have similar uh, strengths around your feelings, but also the liabilities that come with it um, and how shame pops up and your desire to be seen in a very specific light. Um, so hopefully this series has been really enlightening for people. Well, tell us where people can find you guys as Enneagram coaches, um, because there might be specific types out there that are like, oh my goodness, I would love to work with, uh, them, um, as a coach. So Megan, let's start with you as the type two, uh, where can people find you? Yes. So I am in the YAC network coaches directory, so you can find me there. And then you can also find me, um, really most places. So Facebook, LinkedIn, TikTok, and Instagram at Megan Jackson. My name's there. M-E-G-A-N Jackson 444 is my handle. 444. All right. Um, And just for, we'll probably say this again, but for the directory for all of our coaches, certified coaches um, that are in there, it's myenneagramcoach.com. And then you would just search for their name. So again, it's myenneagramcoach is where the um, coaches directory is. All right, Mike, what about you? Yeah, so you can find me in the YUC uh, coaches directory as well. Um, And then uh, we have a website, costl.org, where you could get in contact with me as well through that. Yeah. Mike, I was was a little surprised whenever earlier you mentioned that you didn't have any social media accounts. (laughs) Is that part of the threeness? No, (laughs) that's actually very common for threes and fours. Well, that's why I'm asking. Is it? Is that? It. It was. Is there? It. Did you just never get into it, or was that sort of an intentional exercise? uh, I have LinkedIn and I have Facebook, but they didn't uh, serve the purposes I needed, so I just got rid of them. So I, no. I only tap them when I need them, when I need to find yeah. somebody. Right. So. Gotcha. Well, and so it's Mike Parrott, P-A-R-R-E-T-T. And you can look him up in the directory as well at my Enneagram All right, Leah, what about you? I am also in the YEC network directory and you can also find me at my new Substack, which is leaheverson.substack.com. Uh, I just started a new newsletter there. Or you can find me on Instagram at compassionate underscore Enneagram. And my Ooh. my Substack is also called Compassionate Enneagram if you searched for that. That's great. Oh, love that. Well, thank you guys again so much for 
not just coming today, but really sharing with us your, your heart, your feelings, your emotions, and everything that goes into it. You guys are a gift. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you're enjoying this content and you want to take the Enneagram journey to the next level, we invite you to check out our free Ennea What mini course. In Ennea What, I teach you about the Enneagram, how to find your type, and how to use the acronym AWARE to help you to more effectively apply the Enneagram to your life. To get started with Ennea What mini course, simply click in the link in the show notes. So don't miss out on this opportunity to unlock the power of the Enneagram with our free mini course. Again, thanks again for tuning in and we look forward to supporting you on this journey.